2 Timothy, I'm, I'm hoping we can go through the book of 2 Timothy with the remainder of the year. I counted up, I think I've got about 15 Wednesdays, and so I've got to be able to get four chapters done in 15 weeks, and I'm not sure that'll happen. I'll try to, try to make that happen. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful epistle. Uh, the last one that Paul wrote, by the way, before he is beheaded uh, by Nero. And here he writes, Timothy, if you notice verse number one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his, la- his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight. And as we begin a study of this epistle that Paul writes to uh, his son in the faith, Timothy, Lord, help us to glean some things from this epistle that Uh, Paul wanted to leave with Timothy, and I think not only with Timothy, but also with us. And you inspired this, you breathed these words that Paul had uh, pinned down here to Timothy that uh, we might learn something from them and that we might grasp the truth. And so I pray you'll help us as we launch out into this study here this evening. Uh, Bless the study of your word. Help each one as they listen tonight. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Now, as I said earlier, it's the last uh, epistle, the last letter Paul will write before he is beheaded. That's why in chapter 4 he says, the time of my departure is at hand, and he knows that he's going to die. This is his second imprisonment in Rome. When he first went to Rome, after the shipwreck, you read about an axe and all of that, he gets to Rome, he gets to live in a house. And he gets to have people come and go and see him, and he can study the Bible with them and talk scriptures and such. Uh, He's released, and he leaves, but then he comes back to Rome, and when he comes back to Rome, they imprison him the second time, and this is the time where they'll end up killing him. And this is not where he freely gets prisoners, or visitors. He doesn't, he's closed, and and he doesn't get to see anyone, uh, and he's giving his final instructions, it it struck me. Here he is, he knows he's going to die, he's only only a month away from his death, and his concern now is not about what he's accomplished. His concern isn't about going through his list of things that he's done for God in his life. His concern is that the faith he believed in and the Christianity he stood for would be passed on and would continue to go on after he's gone. It's, it, it reminded me so much of the Kiefer's letter that tonight, here they are, 40 years on the mission field. And what's his burden? What's going to happen when we're gone? Who's going to keep this going on? 
Uh, I want I want laborers to come in and 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 pick up the the work that that when I'm gone this will keep going, and and to see that perpetuated on through the next generation. And so he's trying to give to Timothy here the 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 things that will help him to perpetuate his belief. He's going to remind Timothy about his mother and his grandmother. He's going to he already reminded him in First Timothy about um, uh, making sure that. Uh, you remember who's taught you the things and the way you've been brought up. And he, rem- he reminds him of those things. So to a young minister, it's an invaluable epistle. But it's also valuable to you and me. Just as Christians. Just as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's always of interest to listen to somebody's last words. And These aren't obviously the very last words of Paul, but they're among the last words. Uh, with only a short time to live... And so he's. I think what we're gonna what we're gonna touch on tonight is seven tremendous themes that Paul gives to Timothy here in chapter one. Seven tremendous themes that he gives to him. All right, let's look at them tonight. The first one is the will of God. Notice he said in verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I'm an apostle. Remember what an apostle is? We just got through studying the disciples and the apostles. An apostle was one who had to be, he's the one that was sent forth by the Lord, and he had to have seen the resurrected Christ. Okay? Did Paul ever see the resurrected Christ? Yes, he did. When did he see him? On the road to Damascus. That's exactly right. Remember, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. And, uh, and, and he said, uh, he gave him the instruction how he was going to send him forth to preach. And he'll preach the gospel to the Gentile. And uh, so he was commissioned by God, and he was an apostle. But he was an apostle by the will of God, by the design of God. And so, and by the way, you ought to be what you are by the will of God. You ought to be what you are by the design of God. Uh, the will of God isn't just for Paul. It's not just for preachers. It's not just for evangelists. It's not just for missionaries. The will of God's for every Christian. Every Christian is to live according to the will of God. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's for every Christian. To Prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Turn with me. We'll come back to 2 Timothy. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. Would you, would you please? 1 Peter chapter 4. If you go to your right, you'll go through Titus and then Hebrews. Then you'll have James. And after James, you'll hit 1 Peter. All right? 1 Peter chapter 4. The Bible says in verse 1 there, 1 Peter 4, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Verse 3 talks about how we used to live in the past, before Christ, before salvation. And it talks about lasciviousness, which is looseness. It's talking about living like an animal. Okay, uh, it talks about lust, our desires of the flesh, uh, the excess of wine, the, the 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 revelings, which is the feasting or the carousings, the partyings, the banquetings, the abominable idolatries, on and on, the detestable things that that God wouldn't want. That's how that's how we lived before Christ. We didn't know any better, and that's how people live their life. They just live after the flesh, and he says we're in. They, the people who live that way, they think it's strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, so they don't understand why you don't live that way anymore, so what do they do? Speak evil of you. <laughs> they, they talk bad about you. Okay? And, and who will give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. We live not to the lust of the flesh, but to the will of God. Now that I'm saved, I don't live. I don't do what I want to do anymore. I'm to do what God wants me to do. It's not what I want, what I think, what I feel. It's what God wants, what God thinks, what God feels. It's the will of God. 
What is, how does God want me to respond to this? How does God want me to talk? How does God want me to, what does God want me to listen to? What does God want me to look like? What does God want me to wear? Where does God want me to go? What kind of friends does God want me to have? You see, it's the will of God. It's the will of God. It's the will of God. I don't live after my desires. I live after what God says. That's Christianity. That's living for God. And so it's the will of God. The, the world passes away, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The will of God. So the battle is always my will or God's will. Well, what will it be? That's where the battle lines are always drawn. It was so, so beautiful the other night when he illustrated the, you remember the, his son Jonathan and then big Jonathan uh, representing yourself and how big self can be and how what a problem self can be. Most of the time we blame stuff on the devil. The devil had nothing to do with it. That's just you. That's just me. The biggest battle you have is usually not with Satan. It's with self. It's wanting to do what we want to do. And we find ourselves saying, well, I know the Bible says this, but... Well, I know what I should do, but... And then we're about ready to say what, we're going to, what we have decided we're going to do. The will of God. The will of God. It's no longer about me once I'm saved. The, to the unsaved person, it's always about them. That's just... That's it. Their, their soul and their body, there's no spirit, there's no communication with God. They're not concerned about pleasing God. That's why it's, it's, it's difficult to invite unsaved people to come to church with you. It's hard to, for them to come. They wonder what, and, 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 and when they do come, they think it's boring. Right? And, and listen, what, what the church can't do is try to make it entertaining for the lost person. That's not what church is for. See? The church is for the believer. And, it, and, 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 and they don't have any... It, it all revolves around them. Now, the tragedy is, folks become Christians, and they still think it all revolves around them. Well, God wants me happy. Well, God doesn't want me to hurt. Well, God doesn't want me to suffer. Well, God doesn't want me to... to, 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 to God doesn't want me to be sick. See, and it's all about me. No. You'll find out later on, there's times that it was the will of God that somebody suffer. It was the will of God that somebody was sick. It's the will of God that we go through some things that we don't really want, but it's not my will, but thine be done. What does God want me to do? The will of God. The will of God is always found in the Word of God. Now, you're not always going to find the exact thing that you're looking for. The Bible, the Bible isn't going to say in the Bible, it's not going to say, thou shalt not smoke Marlboro cigarettes. Okay? Because you, you'll think, well, that's not my brand, I'm all right. Okay? <laughs> but, but God can't say every brand. You imagine, we would have to have a, a whole freight train to carry the Bible around because of all the specific commands in it about what we shouldn't do or should do. So God, God gives us principles that we base our decisions on. And, and listen, ignorance is not an excuse. Okay? Uh, when you drive a car and you're driving down the highway and you look in the rearview mirror and there's a man following you and he has blue lights on the top of his car. And he, you get the feeling he wants you to stop. And when he comes up, he says, I, you know what the speed limit is on this road? And you say, no, I don't. Well, it's 35. And I had you going 50. And you say, I didn't know what the speed limit was. And so the policeman says, oh, well, that changes everything. <laughs> because you're ignorant. You didn't know. Well, I, let me inform you. It's 35, so would you be careful from now on? Now that you're aware of the speed limit? Is that how it works, Brother Brett? No. Oh, it isn't. Oh, okay. No. Ignorance is no excuse. If you're driving on that road, who's responsible to know what the speed limit is? The driver is. 
you're supposed to know what, what the speed limit is in that area and, and obey what that speed limit is. Do you really think we'll stand before God one day and we've done things that were wrong? And, and remember, he, we're going to give an account to that, the one who's ready to judge the quick and the dead. And when we say, oh, God, you know, I didn't know that was in there. I mean, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Do you think God's going to say, oh, well, that changes everything? No, no, no. Are we responsible to know the book God's given us? We're responsible to know what's in there. And, and, and so the will of God, the will of God, the will of God. I'm an apostle by the will of God. We don't live the rest of our time to the will of man, but to the will of God. All right? That's the first theme he wants to, to, to strike home to Timothy. The second one is verse number three. He says, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. The second great theme is prayer. Prayer. He's reminding Timothy, I pray for you night and day. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. You'll never get number one done. You'll never die to self. You'll never put the will of God first if you don't pray. In fact, if you don't die to self, you won't pray much anyway. Because self doesn't like to pray. The biggest hindrance you fight when you go to prayer is your flesh. Flesh doesn't like that. Why? Because why would it want to give up control? It wants to stay in control and would rather you do things in the flesh. But we won't die to self if we don't pray. We, we have not because we ask not. So Timothy, I want to make sure you know I pray faithfully for you. Now, listen, if, if, if you have Paul saying that you pray faithfully for... He said, Timothy, I pray faithfully for you. If I'm Timothy, I've got to be thinking, man, I don't pray for Paul every day. I should. And I, if, if that's what he does, I need to pray every day. And I need to pray for people every day. I need to bring them up to the Lord. There's certain people that you ought to pray for every single day. And make prayer a normal, hab habitual part of your life. And make it a, a regular thing that you do. Listen, most lost people don't pray. I mean, there's still people, once they get saved, that we have men that, that, that some of them would take the offering, some of them, are, and, and they'll tell me, don't call on me to pray out loud. They're not ready for that yet. That's, that's still not something they want to do. There are times when you've witnessed to someone, if you've been a soul winner, you've led, you, you lead them to faith in Christ, you're getting them to accept Christ, and you say, now you need to pray and call on Jesus and ask Him to be your Savior, and it's just quiet. What's the problem? They never prayed out loud. They never prayed in front of anybody else. And if they're really honest, they probably never prayed much at all. And so it's very awkward to start talking to God. And, and certainly, the ones who are confident in themselves and are living in the flesh, they never pray. Why? I got this. I can handle this. I just take care of whatever comes along. Now, so if we don't pray, who's going to pray? Do we really live like lost people? If we followed each other around, if someone just followed you around for 24 hours a day for the next seven days, and they just recorded the times that you spent time praying, talking to God, would they conclude that you're really a, a Christian? Prayer. Prayer. Prayer has to be a priority. He's letting him know. He's saying, listen, it's without ceasing. What's Thessalonians tell us? Pray without ceasing. Not just a time where you uh, talk to God and, and you spend time with Him, but then you, you take God with you all day long. You continue to talk to Him. It's the old, you know, the, the, you used to, when, you, when the phone used to be attached to the wall. You know? And you had a long cord that went with it, you know? And if you wanted to walk around while you talked, you got a real long cord so you could walk around the kitchen. Ladies, remember that? 
And, and when you walk around, you need your hands free, so you get one of them little things that attach to your receiver, and you just you cradled that phone in there, and you went on your business talking. How many remember doing that? Yeah, quite a few uh, old codgers remember that, huh? And, and, and listen, that's what prayer is. You, you get alone with God early in the morning, as Jesus did, and then you don't hang up and figure you'll call God the next morning, same time. You just cradle the phone. And as you go to work and as you go about your day, you're keeping God on the line. That's praying without ceasing. It's not driving with your eyes closed and your hands folded. You'll meet God that way. All right? Uh, you, but you want to be in prayer to God. You want to pray without ceasing. Prayer is the way we receive things from God. That's the way God has set it up. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. Every one that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth, and him that knocketh it shall be opened unto him. That's God's way that he can, receive, he can give us the things we want. So we we're to pray regularly. You're to pray specifically. You're to pray continually. And the Bible says we should pray with importunity. That's where the Lord gave the, the idea of knocking and knocking and knocking. Not settling for no for an answer. The fellow came, he gave the example of a guy coming and wanting three loaves at midnight, remember? Go away! My, we're in bed. We're all asleep. Go away. Get out of here. I told you we're in bed. Leave us alone. What don't you understand? I'm not talking Hebrew or I'm not talking Aramaic or whatever it is they're talking. No. I'll tell you what happened. I think his wife finally said, Honey, if we're going to get rid of him, give him some bread, will you? Okay. We want to get some sleep. But, but he wasn't taking no for an answer. You know what we do? And we don't get an answer. We say, huh? God said no. We quit praying. But that's not how Jesus taught us to pray. When my children would tug at me and say, Dad, Dad, and I said, just a minute, I'm talking to someone. And they say, Dad, Dad, just wait, I'm talking to somebody. And then I get done talking, I look down and they're gone. You know what I think? Must not have been too important. Because they went off on their own, didn't, didn't stay with it. But if they keep bugging and they keep bugging me, I say, just a moment, what would you like? I know they really mean business. And they weren't going away until they got my attention. You understand? wonder how many times we've done that to God. We ask once, we ask twice, and God didn't answer, and so we go away, we never mention it again, and God says, must not have been very important to him. Must not have wanted it very bad. Okay? So we pray regularly, pray specifically, pray continually, pray with importunity. Number three, I got to hurry, don't I? Got a long way to go yet. Number three, the third theme is faith. The will of God, prayer, faith. Verse five, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to do what? Please God. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Just before Timothy and Thessalonians is the book of Colossians. Colossians 2 and verse number 6. The Bible says this. As ye have therefore, <coughs> excuse me, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive Christ as your Savior? By faith. That's right. So walk ye in Him. So how am I supposed to walk? By faith. I got saved by faith. I'm to walk by faith. I'm to continue the same way that I got in. We walk by faith and not by sight. Alright? So if I'm, if I'm going to follow God's will, 
and pray as I ought to continually. And I'm going to do that. Listen, I'm following the will and I'm praying to someone who I've never seen. Who no, no one's ever seen. You, you try to convince somebody of that and they want to have you committed. You're talking to someone who's not there. But he is there. How do I know he's there? Faith. Faith. I do it by faith. I do it by taking God at His Word. When he says here, he calls Timothy's faith unfeigned faith. Did you notice? When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. Unfeigned means not counterfeit. Not hypocritical. But it's real. It's sincere. Faith, someone said this, I like it. Faith is living in advance what we'll only understand in reverse. Living in advance what we'll only understand in reverse. We're, we're living right now what later on when we look back we'll understand. We'll see it then. But now we're living as if we do see it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Alright? So that means there's a way I can grow my faith. Say, well, pray for me, Pastor. I just don't have much faith. Well, I can pray for you, but why don't you do something about it? Okay? You can grow your faith. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So I can grow my faith by the Bible. Most of the time when, I, when someone says they have little faith, it's because they have very little Bible. So, I could get more Bible, I will have more faith. If I get much Bible, I can have much faith. See? I can, I can grow my faith. It's the muscle that I, as I feed on God's Word and I act on God's Word and I obey God's Word, God grows my faith. And I trust Him. My, my level of confidence in what God can do and will do in, through, and for me, it begins to rise. Because I read His Word and I memorize His Word and I meditate in His Word. And your level, listen, our level of confidence in God, our faith ought to be growing every single day. The, the, the young Christian should not have more faith than the Christian that's been saved 40 years. I like Brother Kiefer after 40 years. Give me that mountain. Let's take this mountain. Let's get this done. Let's get the camp set. Let's do this. Let's get a church building for this. I like the fact he still has faith in God. And he's believing God for th to get things done. It's not the young person that should have that faith. It's the mature Christian that should have that faith. Why? We, our confidence in God ought to be much higher than a brand new Christian. The blessing here was that Timothy wasn't the first to have faith in his family. Who was the first person to have faith in Timothy's family? Yeah, Grandma. Grandma Lois. She's the first one. Then her daughter Eunice. And then Timothy. No, no record at all of his dad. His dad in the book of Acts 16, it just says his father was a Greek. Never says anything about him being a believer. It's a wonderful thing to pass your faith on to your children. It's a wonderful thing to see them with the unfeigned faith that you had, now they embrace. There's nothing like that. In fact, not only children, but in this case, your grandchildren. The, the, the glory of the man, I think in Proverbs, where the old man is, his children's children. It's not just your children, it's your grandchildren. Seeing them embrace the faith that you have. That's why I think in 3 John it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So it's faith. Alright, let's go to number four. 
the fourth theme that he wants Timothy to have and us to have is verse 6 and 7. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And it's simply the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I believe the gift that Timothy received was the gift of the Holy Spirit. That, that power that, that he could preach and that he could defend the truth. And it's interesting here that it's, it's, it's like in here that you stir it up. Almost like you would uh, stir up a fire. If it's not frequently stirred up, it begins to go out. Okay, we're, Believe it or not, we're, it won't be long and you'll be wanting a fire in the fireplace. Hard to think about that tonight, but uh, you, you'll want that in a few months. And, and um, if, if, you, if, if that fire isn't frequently stirred up or fresh fuel added to it, it'll go out. If you don't throw another log on it, if you don't do, get some help, it's just going to die out. And so uh, there, there's something called flame out. Flame out is when a jet engine fails because the flame in the combustion chamber goes out. Now, there's several things that cause this thing called flame out. It's lack of fuel, insufficient oxygen, or the presence of a foreign matter in the chamber. And just like a jet engine can flame out, our zeal for God can flame out as well. Our fire for God can flame out also. And, and consider those reasons again. Number one, lack of fuel. If you don't fuel your relationship with God, the fire will go out. What you, do, what you do when you take time to read His Word and take time to pray and spend time with God, you know what you're doing? You're throwing logs on the fire. See? David said, while I was musing, my heart burned within me. See, the fire burned. While I'm thinking about God. That... that, that uh, Christian fellowship and being in church and being around other believers. You know what it does? It, it, it helps fan the fire in our heart. It's fuel that's good for us. The second reason that the fire can go out is the insufficient oxygen. There's no airflow. That oxygen, that airflow represents the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. His working in our life. That, that our, listen, it, the Bible and reading the Bible and spending time with God, that's not some intellectual exercise. That's not, a, that's not an assignment that you got to do. I tell the guys when they start their journals in the RU program, you know, it's not, don't take it like a school assignment. I got to fill in every blank here and make sure I try to get the answers right. That's not what that's about. It's not an assignment. It's not, okay, fill in the blank time. This is, this is a relationship with God. This is, this is, uh, real and alive and, and breathing. It's an encounter with God Himself. And, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. How do we understand the Bible? The Holy Spirit of God. He, he, men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Who lives in us? Holy Spirit. The author, did you know the author of the book lives in you? So you have a question, you don't understand the Bible, why don't you ask the author? Let him explain it to you. He's happy to do so. And that's the oxygen that keeps the fire going. Number three, the third thing to put the flame out is the presence of foreign matter. Like a jet engine that would maybe suck a bird into the engine or something. Okay? It happens. That can put the engine out. There's many things that we can allow into our heart, into our mind that distract us from our relationship with God. Put the fire out. Even, even good things become the enemy of the best thing. You get up in the morning and right away, you know what your mind does? Your mind thinks about all the things you got to get done. All the things you need to, to get, get busy and get doing. And you sit down and you try to read and take time with God and your mind is still thinking about all those other things. You know what he's doing? He's putting out the flame. Putting out the flame. And, and you can't let the distractions take you away from the best thing. 
Mary hath chosen the good part. See? That can't be taken away from her. So don't, don't, let, don't let those temporary things, those, those things that are calling for your attention, take you away from the best things. And that's spending time with God. If, again, if we followed you around with a camera, you had your own reality show, and we followed you around with a camera for 25 hours a day and noticed what you spent your time doing, what would we conclude was most important to you? Because what we spend our time on is what's really important to us. If you don't give your relationship with God importance, you'll flame out. That's what uh, the term everybody uses is burnout. Burnout. Why why do people burn out? Because they let the fire go out. And, And these things happen. What happens if you're in a jet and the engines flame out. You say, oh, you just glide to the ground. Oh, really? (laughs) No. They got the gliding capability of a brick. Okay? You're going... You crash and burn is what you do. There's a lot of Christians that crash and burn. Okay? Because God never... God never intended for us to live the Christian life in our own power. You'll crash and burn every time. You have to, that's why the Spirit of God indwells us. You can't run on your own power. It's, it's, it's the difference um, when my wife and I went on vacation. This last August we flew uh, into the airport and um, they... We had a long walk to get from the one plane to the other next plane. And um, the, they have those, what they call, moving sidewalks. You know what I'm talking about? It's conveyor belt, basically, you know what I mean? And some people are walking on the side, but you get on that thing. Now, if you stand on one side, you can just stand there and it just takes you. But you know what happens if you walk on that thing? It's like, phew, man. <laughs> like, whoa, look at me, man. All these other people are standing still. I'm just walking normal, but man, I'm passing people up. And I don't usually pass people up. Let's just leave that there. Learn when to say amen. And uh, that's the difference when you're empowered by the Spirit of God and when you're doing it on your own. It's the same as you walking on that walk that moving sidewalk and when you're one of the people off it just walking on their own power. You're just doing the same stride they are but you're getting way ahead because it's not your power that's propelling you, it's another power. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes you look at some people and you think, man, how do they do what they're doing? How can they get all that done? How can they, can they keep going? You know how? Holy Spirit of God. That's how. It's not their power. See, you look at that and you say, man, I, I don't have the ability to do it. I don't have the power to do that. No, you're right. You don't. It has to be the Holy Spirit. It has to be God's power. And allow Him to give you the ability to do that and the power to do that. Because He says in verse 7, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Oh, I'm afraid I could never do that. Oh, I could never do this. Oh, I don't think... Well, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The, 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 the word fear there is the same word we get our word coward. God hasn't given us the spirit of cowardice, faint-hearted, Timidity, lacking courage. That's all contained in what that word means. 
You remember in the book of Revelation 21 verse 8, God says, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. The very first one on the list, fearful. Same word. Cowards. The fearful's counted in with other people that are unsaved. No, the, the traits that you're yielded to the Spirit of God and you're letting Him be in control, power, love, sound mind. That's the characteristics of being under the control of the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of power. When the word power there, same word of in Romans 1. I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Remember what that word power was there in Romans? Anybody remember? Dynamite. Where did we get our word dynamite from? It's the dynamite of God. Same word. God's not giving us that spirit of cowardice, of fearfulness, of timidity. He's given us the spirit of power of dynamite. You can blow some things up with dynamite. Okay? That's why it says when someone is full of energy, full of excitement, getting things done, we say, man, they're a human dynamo. Dynamite. Energy. Full of uh, energy and power. In Acts 4.31, when it says, when they prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the Word of God with boldness. Listen, everybody's in, everybody, every believer is indwelt with the Spirit of God. Oh, but not all of us are under the control of the Spirit of God. Filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with something, it's going to come out. Can't help it. And so, Timothy, one of the themes you've got to stay on is the Holy Spirit of God. Here's an old preacher getting ready to go home, getting ready to meet the Lord. He wants to pass the baton on to his younger one. He say, here's some things you've got to stay on. You got to stay in the will of God. You got to stay on prayer. I want you to to stay on the Holy Spirit. I want you to stay on faith, your unfeigned faith in God. Number five, number five, verse number eight. I want you to stay on testimony. Notice verse eight. Be not thou. What's the word? Therefore ashamed. Therefore, what's it there for? Say. Because you have the power, because the Holy Spirit of God is empowering you, you need not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, His prisoner. But be thou partaker of the affliction of the Gospel according to the power of God. Therefore, because you have the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind, you don't have to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Testimony. Testimony is evidence. Testimony is proof. Testimony is profession. Don't be ashamed of the evidence, the proof, the testimony of our Lord. Ashamed means to be cast down, to be dejected by conscious guilt, to be reluctant through fear. Timothy, don't be cast down. Timothy, don't be reluctant to stand for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hey, Timothy, don't be reluctant to stand for the Bible, that it is God's inspired Word. Don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He is the only way that men can go to heaven and be saved. Timothy, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus, and don't be ashamed to be associated with those who stand for Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of that. Why would he have to tell Timothy that? Because others were being ashamed. When Paul, later on you'll read, that in my first answer before the Roman authorities, at my first answer, no man stood with me. 
Yet you'll read at the end of several of the epistles, Paul lists numbers of people that traveled with him, worked with him, co laborers with him. When it came down to him going in the slammer for the second time and the final time, nobody's there. Others, Alexander and Hymenius, you read about them later, turned on him. False teaching has crept into the churches. And so he's, he's saying, Timothy, take your stand. Never be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Nor of me, his prisoner. Nero's prisoner? Uh-uh. His prisoner. Who's his? God's prisoner. God's prisoner. He wasn't Nero's prisoner. He was God's prisoner. Listen. For us, it's never be ashamed of to be never be ashamed to be with God, with the people of God, or with the man of God. Never be ashamed of that. Number six, we're finishing up. I'm hurrying. Number six, the sixth theme. Also, verse number eight, when he said. Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Afflictions. You know what affliction is? Prolonged pain of mind or body. Prolonged pain of mind or body. The gospel is supposed to be good news. And it is. It's good news that Jesus died for my sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And I can be saved. I can have my sins forgiven. I can have the gift of eternal life. Hey, that's good news. I'm, I'm adopted into the family of God. I get joy and love and peace and forgiveness. I get all those things. The gospel is good news. I don't have to die and go to hell. Ever. Ever. And neither do you. But you know what else it brings? Affliction. Paul says, Timothy, you be prepared. You're going to have some prolonged pain of mind and body. Moses, Hebrews 11, chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Affliction. Sadly, most Americans choose the pleasures of sin for a season rather than to suffer any affliction. Any pain of mind or body? Well, God doesn't want me to hurt. God doesn't want me to be in pain. Maybe He does. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You think those five times he took 39 stripes or 40 stripes, save one, you think those, none of those marks stayed in his body? The scars that he bore for Jesus? And all he's telling is, Timothy, it isn't a bed of roses, brother. Brother Roloff used to sing, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. He fought the good fight. We hear a lot about the affluence of the gospel. We don't hear much about the afflictions of the gospel. So how can I bear up under that strength? Remember, it's not your power. It's God's power. You remember when Paul, Paul thought the same thing, and we don't have time to go to it. I'd love to, over in 2 Corinthians 12, when, when he had that thorn in the flesh, to, the messenger of Satan to buffet him, and he said, I went to the Lord and said, take this away from me. I don't want to hurt. I don't want to be in pain. God said, I can take it away, but my power won't rest on you then. And Paul said, I'll glory in my infirmity. I'll take the pain because I want the power of Christ to rest on me. Because when I am weak, then am I strong. Because God will empower you to do it, and to go, and to keep on going. 
See, it's, that's why the Holy Spirit of God's called the Comforter. He'll comfort us and help us. The seventh theme is verses 9 through 12, and that is salvation. And I just quickly call a couple things to your attention here. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus for the world began. I want you to notice the Bible says he hath saved us. That's past tense. It's a done deal. Okay? Completed transaction. The songwriter said, Tis done, tis done, the great transaction's done. I am my Lord's and He is mine. Uh, who hath saved us. Alright? The calling. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling. The Calvinists have that in reverse order, don't they? They have the calling before the saving. God says it's saving and then the calling. See, being saved, having been saved, and it's a done deal, transaction, that's the eternal record in heaven. The earthly record is, I am being saved. I am, God is in the process of salvaging my life for His glory and for His honor. I'm called. His purpose in saving me was that He might call me, the Bible says, to His own purpose and grace. That I would live a life for His honor and glory. That I would live a life that brings glory to Him now that I'm saved. Whether I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, I do all to the glory of God. And then keeping. Look at verse 12. For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. He saves me, He calls me, and He keeps me. Oh, you're one of them to believe in eternal security? No, I'm one of them to believe the Bible. That's what it says. He's able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. That day, by the way, is the day when we all stand before Christ. When Paul talked about the crown. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter 4. He says, I've got a crown waiting for me, but not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. At that day. There'll come a day, listen, there'll come a day when we're all going to stand before God. We will give an account for the things we've done in this body. Whether they be good or bad. We're all going to stand before Him to give an account before God. Great themes. Themes that we need to keep before us. Don't, don't. The will of God. Prayer. Faith. The Holy Spirit. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Afflictions. Salvation. These are seven great themes he points out to Timothy that he also points out to us. I pray it would help us to stay on track for him. Let's stand together. Let's go home. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this epistle to Timothy. The second epistle to Timothy. It's, it's helped us tonight. It's given us food for thought tonight. I pray, Lord, that we would grasp these themes as well. That, Lord, not only could we have that unfeigned faith in the Lord Jesus, but that we too could pass it on to our children and our grandchildren after us. Lord, as Paul got older and his brother Kiefer got older and his some of us in this room get older. Our thoughts turn to what will happen after we go to heaven. Well, there will still be those who will grab the baton and say, I'm still going to stay on the same themes. I'm going to walk down the same path. I'm going to keep that unfeigned faith that has been delivered to me. I pray you would put it in the heart of 
younger people in this room to grab these themes and say, I'll be faithful to that. Help us, Lord, to do it. Dismiss us now with your care. Give us safety as we go our separate ways. Make us mindful you go with us. I do pray for Brother Yoder. Pray you'll prosper he and Brother Riley as they begin their meetings there in Uganda. Bless Pastor Amos as he leads it and organizes it. I pray for many souls to be saved and for pastors to be strengthened and helped and edified. We have Brother Moreland as he teaches to pastors in India later on tonight. Give him a profitable session with them. Well, thank you for it, Lord. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.